Good morning. I'm a little bit croaky and coffee today. It's not COVID. Um, and I've not got my PowerPoint, which is my fault. So I'm um, trusting God is going to speak to us today. Uh, you can listen to him, not me. Um, as you've heard, we're about to take a slightly different slant in our autumn series, looking about our stories, sharing the good news of Jesus, um, reminding ourselves of the hope and the new life that we found in him. This key verse... This one I have to start, this one I want my PowerPoint, I have to actually read the Bible. Um, From 1 Peter 3.15 that we've picked up over the past few weeks. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. It always reminds me of one of my friends who, not long after she'd become a Christian, she was with a friend who just said to her, what's life all about anyway? And my friend just kind of went, oh yes, I know what you mean, and carried on. And afterwards, she felt really bad that she'd missed perhaps an opportunity to actually say what she thought life was all about. Having these real conversations with people where we can be honest and share our stories. But at the same time, people who are interested in our faith, in Christianity, um, they can have a lot of questions that go beyond our story, can't they? It's not just a personal, experiential faith. God helped me. He changed me. It's all about me. It's more than that. It's not just subjective. And as Christians, I think we've all had times when we need something beyond our own experience of God. I hope all of us who followed him for a while can look back and see him at work in our lives, prayers answered him, guiding us and helping us. But sometimes the situation that we're in or other people are in, or even looking at the world around us, we can need more than that, because it's hard to see a loving God at work sometimes, isn't it? We can feel like we're walking in the dark, and in those middle-of-the-night moments, perhaps we need more than our feelings and our memories. It can feel like those good times are very far away when we're in the middle of a crisis of difficulty, and that's when we need more than just our story and our experience. Faith, for one thing, and also some more robust answers that we can trust. And not just for ourselves, but like I said, for other people who are interested, who are questioning. Because there are some really tough questions, aren't there, out there that we have, other people have. There will always be mysteries and things we can't get our head around this side of heaven, where the Bible says it's like we're looking in a dim mirror. How can we possibly begin to fully understand this God outside of space and time? This God who made protons and electrons and the electromagnetic forces that make mountains and millipedes and baby smiles and that joy, the mystery of a cup of tea on a cold October day. It's inexplicable. In Isaiah 55, the Lord says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We can't imagine it. We can't begin to see things from God's perspective just by trying to imagine it. We need him to show us. We need that input from the Holy Spirit to teach us his ways and how he thinks. So that means there are going to be questions that are challenging to answer, some because they're just really difficult and complicated, and some because they're heartbreaking. And a little bit of wisdom tells us that pretending we've got the answer when we don't, (laughs) offering that cliche or that little soundbite, that little phrase, um, it's not really helpful. (laughs) It's not how God does it, is it, as the answer to someone's very real pain or problems. You know, Job in the Bible, when he was, his life had fallen apart and his friends came with the answers. Oh, it's because of this, it's because of this. And he knew that wasn't true. And for him, it was just like kicking a man when he's about as far down as he can get. Sometimes we don't know. And so that's the best answer that we can give. Many years ago, I had, I knew someone who had gone through a really big loss in their life. And they used to turn up at my house quite often and just sit at my kitchen table and cry. They weren't a Christian. And they'd say, why me? I'm a good person. Why has this happened to me? And all I could say to them was, it's nothing you've done. But apart from that, I don't know. 
but they really wanted the truth. They really wanted to know this. And I don't want false comfort about what's happened. I want to know the truth. And so they started reading the Bible. And as they read the Bible, they read one verse where it was like God just answered the biggest question they had about this loss. He just answered it. And they knew it was God in a way that I could have tried telling them that and it would have, it would have just bounced off, I think. And through that, they actually found Jesus and they became a Christian. And they said to me not very long ago, they said, Beth, in all those years we've talked since, then and since, about the ups and downs of life and its questions and problems and doubts, she said one of the things that really helped her was that me as a church leader, the times I would say to her, I don't know, I know God is good. I know I can trust him. I know that he does know, but I don't. And how that actually gave her permission to have these doubts and these questions when we don't know. But what really helped her find comfort and healing was, like I said, it was reading the Bible where God spoke to her in a way that me or anybody else couldn't. So as we're moving on to looking at some challenging questions over these next few weeks and how we can possibly even begin to answer them, today we're looking at the Bible and this question people have, how do we know if it's true? How do we know if we can trust it? Because although there are questions we will struggle to answer, and we don't, we're not going to be able to wrap all these things up, it's still a good idea to find out what we can, isn't it? To not just be like, well, I don't know, as in I don't really care. It's important that we gather knowledge and wisdom and intelligence so we can reply as thoughtfully and as helpfully as we can, rather than thinking, well, God's so big and amazing, I'd never even begin to understand it. We have got a responsibility because these are important questions that can and do change lives. So how can we trust the Bible? How can we know it's true? I was thinking there's probably two ways that I would answer this, depending on who was asking. If I was upstairs with the kids this morning and they asked me, I would answer it on a different level, perhaps, to someone who didn't even know if God existed, was really genuinely asking, what kind of information can I have about the authenticity of this book? So I'm going to start most of it with a brief overview of um, some points that might be helpful to those that aren't Christians, that perhaps don't know really anything about it. I'm going to keep it simple because if you're interested in this stuff, you'll probably know more than me and certainly more than I can say in the time we've got this morning. And if you want to know more, you can find lots of stuff online. I'm sure Rob Burwood would have some books because he'll be studying this that you could have a look at. I don't want to bombard us, but just a few points that might help us um, to remember and share if people ask us. And again, I'm sorry, I've not got a PowerPoint, so you could make notes from that. You're just going to have to listen. So firstly, we need to remember that this isn't one book, is it? This is 66 books written over from 1500 BC to 100 AD, so 1600 years with around 40 potentially more different authors. We don't know who all these authors were, but we know that there were kings, there were prophets, there were philosophers, there was Jesus' brother and his friends as followers, poets and musicians, yet spanning hundreds and hundreds of years, covering events spanning far longer than that. There is such harmony and synergy in these books. It is miraculous, not just the ethos and the values, the overarching message, but in the details as well. When you think about the variety of people and the length of time over which this was written, these weren't writing one book and then handing it on to the next person to write the next one. A lot of it was written completely independently. They couldn't have a Zoom meeting to decide what's our take going to be on giving or on forgiveness. But yet, when you read it, there's such harmony. It adds up and comes together so well. I would propose this must be because there is one master author behind the whole lot of it, guiding, inspiring, designing every word. For thousands of years, this book has faced scrutiny, attack, attempt to wipe it out, destroy it altogether, discredit it, disprove it, and so far, no one has succeeded. It's the best-selling book every year by far. In print, 400 million copies every year. As an author, that's way beyond what I'd ever dream of. Um, let alone all the people downloading it now online or looking up your verse of the day or all that kind of thing. Millions and millions and millions 
and millions. And the historical elements are astonishingly accurate when you start to get into this, as I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. They couldn't have been made up. The places and the people are frequently corrobor corroborated by other historical sources from similar times. You know, we know from other evidence that this man Jesus existed, that he was crucified by the Romans. That's not in dispute. But other things as well, things that recent, until recently people dismissed as inaccurate are now being shown to be true. Um, the pool of Bethesda that John talks about, where there was a paralyzed guy that Jesus came and healed. It, John says there was five porches or porticues. And historians, scholars would read that and say, well, that's not true. John made that up. None of the pools had five because there were four sides. They had four. John must have meant it as some symbolic reference to maybe the first five books of the Bible or something like that, whatever. When it was ex ex excavated in the 50s, lo and behold, it's a funny shaped porch, a pool, and it's got five porches and porticues. It fits. It is the best preserved book ever. We know this from discoveries of the ancient scrolls, don't we? Did you do about the Dead Sea Scrolls at school? So in 1947, in these caves, they found huge, huge amount of the Old Testament from, written in 70 AD, and it's shown to be 95% similar to what we read now. It's a miracle. It's incredible how this book has not been changed through the centuries. They found, wrapped in a mummy's wrappings, um, from 100 AD, a fraction of John's Gospel. It's the same as the John's Gospel we, we have today, and there are loads and loads of more examples of that, of surviving manuscripts to back this up. What we read now is what was written then, and it's not just the, the actual words, is it? But it's the truth and the wisdom that they convey have also stood the test of time. As we looked at in the spring, the practical relevance of the Sermon on the Mount, or the breadth of emotion that you find in the Psalms, or these questions like, why me, like Job asked, or in Ecclesiastes? What is it all about anyway? These questions we're still asking today. They're so poignant, so relevant, so wise and brilliant that we founded our modern-day civilization on the principles in this book, didn't we? Even our calendar, 2022, a lot of what it teaches was at the time, in that sort of cutthroat culture, was drastic radical and heard of that you bless your enemies that you welcome the foreigner that every 50 years you have a year of jubilee and cancel all debts and set free all slaves imagine if we did that still now and the power it has to inspire and challenge people to make real difference you know we know people like florence nightingale revolutionizing the healthcare system or will william wilberforce how the Bible inspired him to fight against slavery. He even, do you know he founded the RSPCA based on how the Bible talks about animal welfare and how we should care for God's creation? And what about the prophecies that have come true? Over 500 prophecies in the Old Testament written about Jesus. So that's over 400 years before Jesus. Really specific things that Jesus would have had no control over, like where he was born, and the kind of tomb he was buried in, over 500. And they've all happened and come true. And not just the ones about Jesus. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel made prophecies in 590 BC about Tyre that happened. Micah predicted what would happen to Samaria. Isaiah and Jeremiah talked about Babylon. These are things that can be verified and shown to have happened. It is almost as if they had some inside information about the future. <laughs> or divinely inspired by God would be another way to put it. And you know, this isn't the kind of way people write made up stuff to try and convince people, propaganda. I went to a cathedral school not far from here and the headmaster in assembly used to say, the Old Testament is just Jewish propaganda, isn't it? Now I'm a bit older and wiser, I'd say, well, if it is, some of it's pretty rubbish propaganda, because if we were writing this, we would make the heroes good and the baddies bad, wouldn't we? We wouldn't have David, the greatest king of Israel, talk about the fact he committed adultery that led him to murder. Abraham, like the founding father of the Jewish people, who lied and said his wife was his sister so that the king of Egypt would not kill him to take his wife 
what happened was the king took his wife anyway because he thought she was available and took her into his harem and it was a right mess until God came and sorted it out. We wouldn't include that. The disciples, they died for their faith, some of them, didn't they? They were imprisoned, they were beaten. Why would they include in these stories, trying to convince people, if it wasn't true, about their argument about which one of them was the greatest and Jesus had to tell them off? Or the fact that when he got arrested, they all deserted him. Peter denied him three times. There's loads more examples, isn't there, of the disciples not coming off well. They would not have included this unless they were determined to tell the absolute truth and be completely honest. He also included families, and so things could be verified at the time. Simon of Cyrene, who carried Jesus' cross, um, tells you who his sons were. So when Mark wrote that, after Jesus had gone, a few years later, people could have said, they could have checked and asked ask Simon's sons, did your dad really carry the cross? Across the breadth of the Bible, there is such frailty and raw, desperate human weakness Honestly, some of those stories as well, they are so bizarre you would not make them up. I wonder if you feel that sometimes going into schools and telling Bible stories. I used to feel it when I used to do toddler story time here, and I would be sat there with a load of kids and all their adults listening, most of them not Christians, and I'm telling a story about how a man (laughs) got swallowed by a whale, a fish, and then the fish sicked him up again three days later when he lived, but... Did you know, in 2021, I'll get his name, Michael Packard, a lobster diver, was swallowed by a humpbacked whale and spat out again and survived. People saw it. That really happened. (laughs) Noah? Mm? Makes you realise it's kind of strange. But the greatest and the most outrageous claim in the Bible, that God himself would become an embryo a fetus, a baby, who grew up to be a man who died for you and for me and for everyone else who's ever lived, that he rose from the dead three days later, that he left, he left his spirit to live in his people and that he's coming back one day. That is discussed and explained and argued in such depth and detail so thoughtfully and so brilliantly. That could not be the work of fools or fantasists. And loads of really, really intelligent people believe this book, don't they? People who have read the Bible with the sole intention of proving it to be wrong (laughs) have found God in its pages. You know, historians, philosophers, scholars, scientists, theologians, world-renowned. It stands up. To scrutiny. So I would suggest that anyone wondering if this book is true, the best thing to do is to try reading it for yourself, isn't it? But it is also true that millions of people over thousands of years have found this collection of books to be so much more than just a book. I hope that's true for most of us here. I think the greatest argument is how it speaks into people's lives and hearts. It saves lives, doesn't it? It changes them, it turns them around. The power within these pages brings life and hope into the darkness and despair, answers the strength to keep going, the peace in the worst of storms. The words in this book are so much more than words, than some cosy comfort or, you know, clickbait inspiration. They are real, solid truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Got my little boarding pass from Canada from last month. (laughs) because I haven't got my PowerPoint. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. You want to know what's true? And to make us realise what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So for those of us who do believe, what about this book then? I will tell you there is stuff in here I read and I'm like, God, honestly, that bothers me. I don't understand that. I don't like it. Me, a white, middle class, just about middle-aged woman living her whole life in England, now in the 21st century, I can imagine God saying, Beth, no, 
You can't always instantly grasp something that happened thousands of years ago in a completely different culture and part of the world where death and war was on their doorstep. You, Beth, you've never actually studied ancient history or theology or Hebrew or anthropology. Can't understand this upon your five-minute morning read. Does that mean it can't be true or can't be right? I do these days go online a lot. I'm reading Chronicles at the moment. I'm like, really, God, why were you angry about that? If you search online, you can, more often than not, you can find a really straightforward, simple answer. All oh, right, okay, that's why. The few times I can't, um, I'm able to trust him with it, because that's a few times in 66 books of the most incredible, beautiful, amazing, wonderful truth. I can let my little brain, let that one go, go by for now, in, because his ways are far above my ways. Because if we believe in Jesus, we have to believe in the Bible, because Jesus believed in the Bible. He quoted it, he studied it, he memorised it, he taught about it, he applied it to life in all sorts of practical ways. He talked about Noah, that crazy story, and Jonah and the fish. He believed it was inspired by God. He would say things like, David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said. He believed that. We can't pick and choose the bits we're comfortable with that fit our ways. We can read it intelligently though, can't we? Asking questions, putting context is so important, isn't it? Those who, what, why, where, when kind of questions. Knowing a little bit about the culture in which this was originally happened or was spoken, what was normal for them. Understanding that some of these books aren't history books. They're philosophy, maybe, or they're poetry, Isaiah 55 says, The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. We can take that's maybe not literal. When Jesus said, I am the vine, we, we can understand he wasn't saying he was an actual plant. So we need to be aware of the potential for metaphor <laughs> throughout the Bible. It wasn't all meant to be taken completely literally. It's also really important to apply context within the rest of the book as well. There's a verse in Ephesians that says, wives, submit to your husbands. You know that one? Do you know the verse before? It says, submit to one another. Maybe the wives at the time needed an extra reminder. I don't know. It's also really important to think about translation because that word submit does not mean unquestioningly obey. In the original language, it's talking about respect and honour and know you go first putting someone else before yourself. It's really important we know these things, isn't it? Often there's not a literally literal word translation from the original language to us. This book is trustworthy. Our interpretation of it isn't always, might not always be. We need to read it with the help of the Holy Spirit, prayerfully, because people can pluck out one verse and cause all sorts of trouble, can't they? And at the same time, The Bible is a living book. It had the meaning then, but wouldn't you know that God is clever enough to use it then to speak to us and our situation? I asked God a question once about a child living in my house. We've had a lot of different teenagers in our house over the past few years. The universal thing with all these very different kids has been none of them like to see a carpet, clothes, books, rubbish, on the floor. Now we have tidy room, tidy room takeaways. We've kind of sorted it. But at the time, there was, there was one child a few years ago who, this situation was really bad. <laughs> Their bedroom wasn't just messy. It was gross. It was rubbish. It was food stuff. It was smelly when they left their bedroom door open. You could smell it. And I, I'd done what I could. This was before the tidy room takeaway idea. And like bin bags, and should we maybe clear it? And I was getting nowhere. And it really bothered me because it was awful. And I was in bed not being able to sleep one night. And I just pray, I was praying, but I said to God, feeling really sad, like, God, why are they okay with living in basically a pit of rubbish? And straight away, God said to me, because they feel like rubbish. So I got up the next morning and I got on Bible Gateway and I searched for rubbish, garbage, trash, 
God, what have you got to say about this? Because this is not about a tidy room. That's not the real problem here. And more than once in the Bible, there's a verse. One place you'll find it is Psalm 113. And I'm not saying that all kids with messy bedrooms feel like rubbish. This was one child. And it says, God lifts the needy from the rubbish heap and he sets them among princes. And knowing this child and their potential and their dreams and hopes for the world, I thought, yes. They were born to be among princes, to be speaking to the leaders of our land. I really believe that for this child. So I could continue to hand them a black sack, bribe them, persuade them, argue with them about hiding their room, or I could stop praying the word of God that he would lift them from the rubbish heap and they would know who they were. So that's what I started doing. I wrote out and every day I started praying for this child. And every so often there'd be a rustle in the kitchen as they got themselves a bin bag and tidied it up. And the day they left us, they're not with us anymore. Their room is tidy, they vacuumed it and they're gone. And I will tell you now, they are on track for that. They are, they're well on their way. I'm absolutely believing that for them. As a quick aside, I'm I'm nearly finished, I'm coming to the end. If that kind of prophetic type of parenting is new to you, I'm going to be doing a parenting group, a life group after half term. That's one of the things we're going to talk about because we can deal with the external behaviour or we can get to what God really wants to do in these children's lives, can't we? But the point is, there is the original meaning and application, but this book is alive and the Holy Spirit uses it to change things now. For me, it simply adds up. I've been following Jesus for as long as I could remember. I knew him before I could read. But when I started to read this book, and I read it now every day, I met the God. I found in there the God I already knew to be true. It fits with what I'd already learned about him. When I follow this book and when I apply it, I know I'm going to make fewer mistakes. I'm going to hurt people less. I'm going to be a better person than when I don't. I cannot think of a testimony when God has impacted me, changed me, got me through a storm, showed me which way to go, answered my prayers that on some level, somewhere, does not include the words from this book. It has stood the test of time through the the centuries, and it certainly stood through my 46 years for sure. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, "'Does not my word burn like fire?' says the Lord. Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? If you've got rocks in your life, if your friends, your family, your colleagues have got rocks in their life, the answer is in this book. The best way to find out if the Bible is true, to be able to answer that question when people ask, is to read it. Do what Jesus did. Meditate on it. Soak in it. Learn it. Pray it, quote it, share it, and with the grace of God and the empowering of his Holy Spirit, church, let's live it. Rob spoke about Spurgeon last week, another quote from Spurgeon. He said, scripture is like a lion. Who heard of defending a lion? Just turn it loose. It will defend itself. We're going to sing again, but I'm going to pray as the band comes up. God, I want to ask forgiveness for the times when we have discredited, dismissed, ignored this incredible gift you've given us of your word, of these books. May we be a people who find you there, who find truth there, who take the time to read it, to learn it, to get it inside us so that we can know your ways. And God, I want to pray for anyone here this morning, anyone who's listening online who feels like they've got rocks, they've got obstacles, they've got mountains in their way, God. May they find the truth, the power in your word to get through that. Amen.